Now, James Bridle is a writer, artist, and technologist. Their artworks have been commissioned by galleries and institutions and has been exhibited worldwide and on the internet. They are the author of The New Dark Age and Ways of Being, both of which are to be found in our pop-up library under the stairs in the foyer. Um, they also wrote uh, and presented New Ways of Seeing for BBC Radio 4 that I strongly recommend listening to. And maybe most importantly, they've been a keynote speaker at the conference twice, which is a very rare thing. And we're super happy to have them back. Please give a warm hand to James Bridal. Good evening. Hello. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Martin, for that introduction. Thank you to everyone at Media Evolution, the whole team, for having me back. Uh, thank you to Mama Live for hosting us. Thank you all very much for being here. It's an honor and a pleasure. Um, I'm going to talk a little while about intelligence. Um, what we mean when we talk about it, um, and how it seems to be playing, how those ideas of it seem to be playing out in the world. And I'm going to start that story here. Uh, this is a lake in Ipirus in northern Greece. Um, I live in Greece. I'm from the UK, but I've lived in Greece for uh, almost eight years now. Uh, and Ipirus is right up in the north, up against the Albanian border. And it's one of the most beautiful places on Earth. It's really, really quite stunning. It's a landscape of mountains and little villages. Um, and it's not heavily populated, and it nourishes uh, some of the most important populations of bears, wolves, eagles, Dalmatian pelicans, and all kinds of other critters uh, still going around in Europe. Um, and, uh, and it's a wonderful place that I love very much. Um, and I was up there a couple of years ago uh, and I went for a walk in these woods, and what I found um, was uh, lots of these things. These little wooden stakes stuck into the ground, uh, kind of marked with little sprays of um, uh, spray paint, and uh, sort of tagged with these numbers, couldn't read or didn't understand what they resembled. Uh, and as I walked through the woods, I kept finding more and more of these stakes marked out through the gr uh, kind of across the ground, realizing, in fact, that they ran like, further than I could walk. And in fact, in subsequent days, driving around, saw them on trees and on fences, um, realizing that they actually composed a, gra a vast grid that had been sort of superimposed on the landscape as if by some kind of alien superintelligence, um, which is kind of what was going on. Um, because in the last decade or so, uh, the Greek government has sold off oil and gas exploration rights to Ipirus, uh, a couple of other regions, and a large chunk of the, um, uh, the, the sea that borders uh, that side of Greece. Um, and what it was, what I was seeing on the ground, was a survey grid. Um, uh, as they're doing a series of kind of seismic explorations through the region to try and find deposits of oil and gas. Um, but they're also the tooth and claw marks of an artificial intelligence, um, because that's how oil and gas exploration works these days. Uh, the company that, that's doing the exploration up in Ipirus, a Spanish company called Repsol, uh, have long-standing partnerships with IBM, with Microsoft, um, uh, with Google, uh, with all the large corporations that you know about making AI, to um, use this technology, this thing we call AI, that's mostly just really fast, expensive computers, um, in order to make their operations more efficient, to better evaluate the uh, value of um, uh, like oil uh, reserves below the ground, uh, to basically make the process of extracting and burning oil uh, ever more efficient. Um, which, let's face it, seems like the most stupid possible thing we could be doing in the present. Uh, we all know what the consequences of extracting that oil and gas will be, not just for the landscape of Ipirus and the various creatures, human and non-human, that live there, uh, but for all of us. Uh, that the process of extracting and burning 
every single remaining drop of oil uh, under the ground um, will doom many kinds of life that exist in the present. And so there seems to be something fundamentally wrong with our very idea of what intelligence is if this is what we're putting artificial intelligence to use to do. We've got something very wrong in our idea of what all of technology is for, but I think particularly worryingly this concept of intelligence. Um, not least because artificial intelligence is not only being used for oil and gas, it's also um, a vast user of energy itself uh, and a vast um, emitter of carbon and other greenhouse gases. Um, the, the global internet produces, um, has about the same carbon footprint and growing as the entire airline industry. Um, and that's just the stuff that happens in the cloud. It doesn't include you charging all your devices and all that kind of stuff. Um, but AI being um, an incredibly resource intensive process, it uses a lot of computers running very hot that need cooling and power. So even the artificial intelligence itself, before it even gets to effects, is a huge, um, it's just heading in the wrong direction, let's be clear. Which kind of should be evident from the way in which it's being deployed in the world. Um, it also seems to me to be incredibly significant and telling that most of the places in which we've heard about AI, um, because we all have in recent years, it's, it's having this kind of cultural moment which in itself is kind of interesting for a thing that no one really knows what it is, and it probably doesn't really exist. Um, uh, but, it's, but you hear about it all the time, it's this incredibly powerful thing. And almost always what you hear about is it beating humans at things. Uh, quite often things that we enjoy, right? That it seems to be almost exclusively being developed as a tool to uh, remove human joy uh, and to replace us in various ways and ultimately to supplant us. Um, which again seems not very intelligent, at least from our perspective. And once again, it seems that there's something very, very out of whack about this. And what I've kind of come to think about that is, um, well, when you understand that artificial intelligence is something that is broadly put into practice as something acquisitive, um, industrial, to make profits, uh, to decrease the joy in human life, and to pay people less, uh, you understand that it's not intelligence that's at work here, but a very narrow version of intelligence, which you can think of essentially as corporate intelligence. It's the intelligence of a corporation. It's what an in a corporation thinks is intelligence. It's what a very narrow view of business success looks like. And that's mostly what we're talking about when we talk about AI. We're talking about automating various forms of mostly quite acquisitive business that are dedicated to profit maximization rather than any other particularly variable that, that might benefit us in the world. And that seems to me to be both hugely problematic for all the dangers that it causes and all the damage that it's doing, but also just like the most colossal failure of imagination. Um, just a really weak, attempt on our part to think about what intelligence itself might be. And as I started to think about that more and more, I started to try and ask that question of what an intelligence actually is. And, and, and one of the strange things when you start talking about intelligence is that actually, despite all this talking we do about it, there's really not any good solid definition of it. Um, there's lots of terms that people use, things like theory of mind, planning ahead, um, being able to solve certain complex problems, um, forms of communication, memory, or, and you can kind of take a grab bag of these qualities depending on how you want to construct an idea of intelligence. But really the working definition of intelligence for us most of the time is what humans do, right? And that's also our vision of what we kind of think AI was going to be. That's the kind of science fiction version of AI that'll be kind of a version of the human. But what's become really, really interesting just in the last decade or so, but based on research that's been going on for a lot longer, is in the first place, it turns out artificial intelligence, whatever it is, is not really like human intelligence at all. It's something quite different. It's behaving in very different ways. It thinks in entirely different ways to us. 
It, it's very good at certain things that we're not very good at. Um, uh, and it's terrible at things that we find very easy. It essentially it thinks about the world differently, which is not really surprising when you think it's basically locked in small boxes in large corporate offices. And at the same time, in the last 20 to 30 years, there's been this incredible flowering of research and understanding of non-human intelligence, of what intelligence looks like beyond the human. And that's where I want to go with thinking a bit about you know, what, what a planetary intelligence, what other forms of intelligence might actually be more interesting than this. Um, as I said, one of the problems we've had for so long is that we tend to define intelligence as being what humans do. And it colors our ability to recognize intelligence when it's done differently. Um, classic examples of this is all of the kind of tests that humans do on other animals to see if they're kind of worthy of joining the club, right? Which we don't really want them to do. I mean, we barely let most humans join that club. Um, so the idea that, that non-humans might do it is a kind of existential threat to us, it feels like a lot of the time. Uh, and yet, they do all kinds of amazing things. One of the... Um, but we're, yeah, but we're really, really bad at seeing it. And one of my favorite examples of that is, uh, is Gibbons. So one of the classic tests of um, intelligence is tool use. So you provide an animal, usually locked safely in a cage, uh, with some kind of tool, and then you place like a nice treat outside their cage, and you see if they can use the stick to get the treat, or you know, whatever variation on that is. We've been doing this with animals for decades, and um, mostly with creatures that are genetically close to us, so the apes and various monkeys. Um, and, and most of them are pretty good at this, right? Um, it, it strikes, it seems like quite a simple thing. So gorillas and orangutans and chimps, and also um, uh, bonobos and macaques and quite a lot of monkeys um, are very good at this. But for some reason, for years, uh, gibbons just were not interested. They just absolutely refused to uh, participate in this. And, um, uh, and this was a problem for science and for our understanding of what intelligence is, or at least kind of various forms of brain development, because bonobos are kind of in the middle of that list of, of other animals that I mentioned. And so if, if intelligence has kind of worked its way up through our, through our lineage, with us, of course, perched happily at the top, um, then they should be intelligent, but they, they refused to do this test. Um, until one day, someone had the bright idea of, of redesigning the test in some way. And what they did was that they took those sticks that had been lying on the ground, and they hung them from the top of the enclosure. And as soon as the gibbons saw that, uh, they immediately went, oh. And in that moment, they sort of became intelligent in our eyes, right? They passed the test. And the basis for that was that we redesigned the test to acknowledge a different form of intelligence. Because gibbons are brachiators. Right? They spend most of their time up in the trees and swinging around. And they have an intelligence that's patterned in correlation with their body. So that their awareness of the world and their focus of problem solving is oriented to a different pattern of awareness than those of us who walk around on the ground. And so that they inhabit a different sensory universe, and thus their, thus their intelligence has a different form and shape. And that's kind of one of the first real lessons about, about these intelligences, is that and when thinking about other intelligence, is that intelligence is embodied, and it's part of one's experience. It's not something that just exists inside the head or inside the brain, but is something that is part of one's pattern of life. It's relational. It exists as a, um, an interaction with the world around, around oneself that's also um, uh, you know, deeply matters how you inhabit a body and how you inhabit the world. And so immediately you can see that different forms of creature who have different lives and different body patterns will, ha will do intelligence differently to how humans or you know, other creatures do it. And that gets really interesting when you start to look at creatures um, that are very, very differently embodied and socialized and everything else to us. The octopuses, I'm sure you've heard these stories because the octopus is having a bit of a moment at the moment. They're kind of intelligent celebrities at the moment. But they are really, really brilliant. It's kind of impossible not to talk about them. Um, but because, because they are so radically different to us. Um, and I, I want to highlight this quality of, of difference of intelligence and, and why it matters to think about it. Um, like, it's hard to think of a a creature with a recognizably large-ish brain that is as different to us on this planet than the octopus. Um, but of course, we are related to it. 
um, because everything on Earth has a kind of last common ancestor. And ours and the octopuses is about 14 billion years ago. Um, uh, and it was probably some kind of blind flatworm that uh, lived on the bottom of the ocean. But we both come from that blind flatworm. Right? Um, along two totally separate branches of the evolutionary tree. And yet there are these marked differences. The eye of the octopus, for the example, is very similar to ours. Um, it's a kind of round orb filled with gel, with a lens and uh, rods and cones and all that stuff. Um, it's in fact slightly better than ours, uh, because it, it doesn't, the optic nerves joins differently, so it doesn't have the little blind spot that humans and other apes have in their vision. Um, but it's very like our eye, but it evolved completely separately. It's what's called parallel evolution. So it's totally separately, the forces of evolution converged on this particular tool for seeing and engaging with the world. And certain people have made, are making the argument, I would make the argument, that the same thing is occurring with intelligence in this case. That even though 28 million years, 14 million years all the way down that way, 14 million years all the way back up there, um, separate us and the octopus, this intelligence has evolved differently in these different cases. Evolved differently in different species, but evolved everywhere. And this whole hierarchical notion we have of intelligence as being a kind of a thing that rises up towards some point, once again, high us at the top, uh, is, a, is a huge mistake and belongs in the trash can with the whole idea of uh, the tree of evolution, which has also, I won't go into in such detail now, but has also been felled, if that, you didn't know that. Um, uh, it simply doesn't work that way in terms of vertical hierarchies, and that's the thing we've been learning. Um, once you start to go into these kind of strange abilities, um, it gets really, really interesting indeed, because it suddenly it also goes way, way beyond the animal. Um, one of my favorite scientific experiments from a few years ago was when um, scientists took a bunch of um, crest plants and they recorded the sound of caterpillars munching on the leaves. And then they played, uh, and then they took the caterpillars away. Um, and then they played that sound to a bunch of other uh, crest plants. And monitoring the chemicals in their leaves, they realized that the plants immediately flooded their leaves with uh, a kind of toxin which is meant to deter the, deter the caterpillars. And everyone was like, oh, excuse me, <laughs> the plants are listening, they can hear, uh, and they can hear, plants can hear. Um, <laughs> and we don't really know how. Uh, in fact, we have no real idea, we don't know what the mechanism is. And it's one of these things that sort of confounds not just like what we thought the plants were doing, because apparently they're listening, um, but, also, but also like our method for going about and understanding the world, because historically, um, botany and most of the natural sciences, they proceed on a kind of hypothesis basis where you, where you presume an ability and then you design a bunch of tests around it. Uh, but when the plants just kind of demonstrate this ability for, ourselves, for, for us, but for themselves, um, in ways that kind of defy our usual desire to cut them into tiny, tiny pieces and figure out how they resemble tiny robots, we don't really know, know how to respond. Um, it, it demands a kind of different relationship with them, um, as does the effect that plants remember. Um, so there's a scientist called Monica Galliano, who I'm only going to tell half her story to save time, but I'll happily talk about her work a bit more in the Q&A, perhaps. Um, what Galliano did was she took a bunch of um, mimosa plants. So if you don't know mimosas, they're these little kind of plants, nice flowers, and these tiny little kind of strip leaves. But they're very unique in that they're one of the few plants that moves at a speed that humans can really notice. They're also known as touch-me-not plants, because if you touch the leaf, they'll, at that speed, curl up very quickly. So you can see their reaction, which is quite unusual for plants. So they're quite good for various types of experiments. And what Galliano did was she took a bunch of these plants and she put them kind of in a pot on a little rail with a little foam pad about 10 centimeters below, and she dropped them like that. And the plant would immediately close up because it didn't like the shock. And she'd do it again. She'd do it over and over again. And she found that after sometimes only three or four times, sometimes longer, the plant would stop closing up. And she did a bunch of other checks to like, test it wasn't just tired, right? Uh, to, you know, the, uh, to check that like different, like different stimuli, it would still close up. It was only this stimuli, when repeated, it would stop doing this response to. And also, um, uh, 
She also left some of these plants for weeks and months and tested them again later, and they still remembered. And once again, <laughs> we don't have no idea how they're doing this. And it's, like I said before, it's, it's a it was an experiment that was almost impossible to construct along standard biological um, or bot botanical principles, because it didn't propose a framework with which to understand this. It was more just like, here's a plant, let's, see, let's treat it as an organism, as a creature that has its own life and awareness and being, and see what happens when it experiences the world in this particular way. As I said, there's more to that story, but I'm not going to tell it all now. Um, uh, but um, plants hear, and they remember. Um, uh, they also do all kinds of other things. Various plants can smell. They have a kind of quite large range of senses. Uh, they do certain kinds of planning. Um, they have certain. They have proprioception, which is what we call our ability to um, know where bits of ourselves are without seeing them. Um, they have a, a whole bunch of kind of experimental results of this and show that plants are capable of things that we simply had no idea they were doing. Um, and we'll never know, right? This is one of the other interesting things about it that I enjoy. Um, it's impossible, like we can sort of imagine like what it might be like to be a, um, uh, a baboon or a um, macaque or a uh, you know, bonobo or a gibbon. That's one I was actually trying to remember, a gibbon. Um, and even like an octopus, maybe sort of weirdly squiggly, but um, like the, the experience of being a plant is, is completely impossible and alien to us. And so it throws up some really interesting questions about how we think about experiencing the world, about being intelligent, about having a sense of the world that plants have, right? Like whatever, whatever the, have you construct that intelligence, plants hear and sense the world in various ways, which means they share the world with us, right? We live in a shared world. We, we acknowledge that everyone around us is experiencing that world that is not the same as the world that we experience, but because we're mostly human, we can kind of make a kind of composite version. But we start, have, really have to start to come to terms with the idea of a world that's composed of so many radically different perceptions of the world, many of which are completely inaccessible to us and will always remain so. And yet, they exist. We share a world in which all of those perceptions are in play all the time, even if we're not you know, able to, to imagine ourselves into them. One more crazy, weird but critter story, and then I'll talk about a different aspect of this. Um, uh, this is a slime mold. Um, slime molds are difficult because they, they don't even fit into any of the categories. Uh, they used to be considered fungi, but they're not fungi. Um, they're not algae or something else either. They trouble all our species definitions. They also trouble our definitions of what constitutes an individual, because sometimes they split up into single-celled creatures like amoebae, and sometimes they come together in great kind of floating sacks of proto uh, protoplasm filled with like free-roaming nucleuses. Um, and some of those will sacrifice themselves for other bits of the creature, community, whatever it is. Um, so they have all these strange qualities that make them very interesting to science and, and also break science in really interesting ways. One of their particularly interesting qualities is that they're very, very good at finding the most efficient route between different things. So if you put them on a Petri dish uh, with a few like dots of food, they'll work out what is the most kind of shortest route between those things. A few years ago, some researchers in Tokyo did this where they put um, oat flakes, which the slime mold loves, on a, on a little dish in the shape of the major metropolitan areas surrounding Tokyo. Um, and they also shone lights in various places um, to represent kind of rivers and natural obstacles, mountains, because they don't like light very much. And within 24 hours, the, the slime mold basically recreated the Tokyo Metro Rail Network, um, which is a neat trick. Um, it was even more surprising when um, researchers tested on a thing called the traveling salesman problem. Um, fairly, relatively simple problem to explain in that, imagine you have to visit six cities. Uh, and you want to figure out what's the shortest route to visit all of them in one go without revisiting them. It's actually like a big like money problem for like logistics companies and stuff. It's computationally incredibly hard. Um, computers and humans really suck at this problem because there's no shortcut. You basically have to count all of the routes, um, which means you need to calculate. Like if you've got five cities, that's five times four times three times two times one route. 
If you add one more city, it's six times five times four times three times two times one roots. Right? And that means the graph of how hard that problem is to solve goes like this. Right? It just gets harder and harder. It's called exponentially hard. Humans computers suck at it. Slime mods don't. They solve the problem in linear time. Uh, the graph looks like that. Um, it doesn't get harder for them, and we don't understand why. <laughs> But it's a really long-standing problem in mathematics, and these single-celled creatures are better at solving it than either us or the most powerful supercomputers we've ever built. And as I say, it's probably just like a party trick for them. It's just something that they do. And I'm really interested then in the question of, like, what else can they do that we don't know how to ask them, right? That we don't relate to them in ways that will actually recognize the problems that they themselves are solving, that perhaps that we also struggle to do. So the broader, the broader arc of what I've been saying so far is that this hierarchical, hierarchical conception of the world that we have around intelligence, but kind of pretty much everything else, is, is, is falling apart, it's collapsing. The, the, the idea of anything resembling a higher intelligence, or particularly the uniqueness of human intelligence, um, no longer holds. Um, it's simply not the case. It's not, it's not what's happening in the world. It's not what we can observe. Um, and that calls for a fairly radical rethinking of how we relate to everything else in the world. Um, not least because perhaps we have something to learn. Um, it's pretty obvious that the focus on human uniqueness and the, the particular ways in which we do intelligence and considering that to be special and unique has had pretty disastrous effects on how we live upon this planet. And I think it's somewhat crucial that we reimagine our relationships to everything else, based on a whole bunch of principles, not just that they're smart. But I think intelligence is a really interesting and useful way of seeing the ways in which they <laughs> have something to teach us, whether it's the slime molds, whether it's something else we have yet to figure out how to ask. We live on a world of multiple forms of intelligence, of multiple ways of thinking about the world. And as we struggle to think about our world in so many ways, how to act, how to change, how to be differently, then the realizations of how many other kinds of thinking are available to us if we pay attention to them and start thinking about them seems like a fairly primary issue to me. And there's kind of a two ways that I've, I kind of go about doing this. Um, the first is how to kind of change, um, how to make a change in what the sociologist Raymond Williams called the structure of feeling, right? Like how we exist in the world, how we embody, how our relationships work, which is kind of a necessary precondition for making larger scale change. And the second thing is like, how to actually make that change? What, what changes based on this kind of awareness might actually look like? I'm gonna talk about the first um, one first, which is how you change your structure of feeling. Um, I did a few weird experiments like this uh, while, while thinking about this, writing about it. Um, one day in my garden, I went out and cut a um, piece of bamboo rod that's uh, 115 centimeters long. Um, there's a thing that's called the mean velocity of climate change. Right? Um, as the globe, as the world is heating up, ecosystems are essentially moving. Right? You understand this is that, that as it's getting warmer in various places, that temperature and various other things are moving across the surface of the planet. Um, and so that if you stay in one place, that place is going to get warmer. If you move with the temperature change, then you will actually basically stay within your own ecosystem. Um, at the time of writing, the, the global average mean global type of time of writing, time of speaking, um, the, the global mean average speed of climate change is about 0.42 kilometers per year, which is 115 centimeters per day. That's how fast you have to move to stay in the same ecological conditions. And that varies widely. If you're starting in the middle of a desert, in the middle of a planet, you've actually got quite a long way to run. If you're already halfway up a mountain, because this is moving towards the poles and it's moving upwards, uh, you're going to run out of space very quickly. And so some things I do are things like this, which is to take a, a bamboo rod, I took it out in my garden, and I literally moved the plant, uh, a few of the plants in my garden, 115 centimeters north. In order to 
understand a little bit of a change in our relationships, uh, a change in how that we need to think, not just as humans, but as other creatures in responding to this. Because plants have been responding to climate change for tens of thousands of years. After the last ice age, um, the, uh, the, the forests of Europe regrew from the south in only uh, a few couple of tens of thousands of years. Plants, uh, trees uh, were capable of responding to uh, changes in climatic conditions um, far faster than human migration actually occurred. Um, we don't think of plants as being on the move, uh, but in fact they're on the move again now. Huge tree migrations and other plant migrations are in process right now. Um, across Europe and North America, deciduous trees are largely moving kind of westwards and northwestwards uh, because it's not just temperature, it's kind of wetness and other things as well. And coniferous plants are largely moving north at speeds of 10 to 20, 30 kilometers a year in some places. And so there is this change that's occurring all around us, but that we're not aware of. Still for us, climate change so often seems to be ha something that's happening completely in the abstract. Um, and becoming aware of things like plant migration, or even just doing those few little steps, to me is a way of m creating a new kind of form of awareness that is not the same as plant or other animal awarenesses, but is connected to it in interesting ways. And this has a really nice, long, interesting history. Um, one of my uh, favorite books is a book called uh, The Power of Movement in Plants that was written by Charles and his son Francis Darwin um, in the 1880s. Um, uh, th there's no pictures of this happening, by the way. I got an AI to draw this one, but it came out so much nicer than any other AI picture I've ever seen I decided to put it in. Um, and what they did was that they hung, uh, they took a bunch of plants and they hung um, large sheets of glass in front of them. And then they sat there watching them for days at a time, tracing like the tip of a leaf as it moved over time, putting little dots on the thing and then connecting them up. Um, uh, this sheet of glass effectively kind of magnifying the effect by the distance from it. And what they ended up with was these kind of incredible um, drawings like this that detailed the ways in which plants actually um, were motive, were responding to the world around them. Um, and partly because of this, and partly as I'm sure you've all seen, the kind of, um, essentially an early form of time-lapse photography, which has become a really big thing on, on nature documentaries. And um, because my computer hates me, I can't show you a video of the various time-lapses that I've been making. But I've spent a lot of the last couple of years making time-lapses. Um, uh, literally just taking a little camera out and sticking it in my garden and watching the footage a couple of days later and watching a place that appears to me to be um, static, unmoving bursting into life. It's the most incredible thing. But there's something really, really key about it that I try and explain when I talk about this. Um, it's not enough just to watch time lapses. Um, you can't just, like there's loads of cool ones on YouTube, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the practice of actually making them oneself. Um, there's something qualitatively different, that's different that happens to your awareness when you actually do it yourself because you've invested your own time and energy and patience in the thing. You've created the space for it, and you've actually um, embodied that awareness of that process that you're describing. And so this is not, so I'm saying that the, the, these processes are not things that you can just read about, that the necessary change in the kind of structure of feeling, that our own awareness and, and responsiveness to other concepts requires us to engage with them ourselves to meaningfully participate in them, and not just to kind of read about them or, or be aware of them. And that probably has wider um, environmental lessons, let's say. And technology has a really big role to play in this. One of my kind of big goals with this ongoing project was that I wanted to find out what what that role might be. Um, because most ecological arguments tend to either invoke a kind of technological apocalypse where we carry on down our present ro road, uh, ending in disaster, um, or we kind of reject everything from technology. Um, and you could see from, from the beginning of my talk how you could see I could be going that kind of direction with AI, but I have some counterexamples. Um, uh, because we've used technology in all kinds of ways throughout history to give us this kind of view. These are, 
uh, spectacular satellite images from Landsat, which allow us to see the composition of the world in ways that we were not before, because computational vision sees differently to the human eye. Right? These, these satellites are equipped with cameras that allow you to see, for example, the, the, um, the amount of moisture in a plant, um, or like the composition of the metals below the soil. Um, they allow us to see the world in ways that were simply not possible before, both at the, like I was talking about, the scale in time, but also the scale in uh, the scale of the planet. Back in the um, uh, Second World War, um, a bunch of uh, uh, British uh, researchers were developing some of the first radar. Um, and for various reasons, uh, several of them were ornithologists uh, because they'd been university professors and a lot of those sort of people got seconded into these kind of research organizations. There was a particular guy called David Lack. Um, and he started hearing about these weird things that were happening on the radar, uh, these strange patterns that would appear on these early forms of radar that the radar operators called angels because they couldn't explain them. They created these kind of strange circular patterns. Um, uh, you know, they'd appear on the radar screens at night and like set off kind of uh, air raid alerts, but then nothing would happen and they wouldn't know what was happening. And Lack and a couple of other people basically worked out after a while it was birds um, showing up on the radar. And why this was hard was because at the time, people didn't believe or scientifically prove that birds flew at night. Um, this was entirely unknown knowledge that there was mass bird movement and migration at night. In fact, the, the, there was very little known about bird migration at all. And it was only with the use of radar in the Second World War and its development that this whole world of animal life kind of sprung into being. Um, and now we have huge planetary scale radar networks in which you can see the entire uh, kind of dusk and dawn murmurations of vast numbers of birds on continental scale radar, this is the next star radar on the US, So you can go to websites like there's one called Eurobird Portal, which tracks the migration patterns of birds, and you can look it up and you get bird forecasts for your area, because they know when they've left various other places to arrive. So we have this ability to make visible and see a world radically different that our technology is, is giving us access to, that we've never had before. And it's our choice, as with AI, about how we use that technology. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is um, um, a few years ago, um, uh, one of the, the directors of kind of Earth or space observation rather at NASA got a phone call from um, uh, someone who said they were from the National Geospatial Agency. If you don't know the National Geospatial Agency, it's basically the third kind of major US spy organization after CIA and NSA, NSO, no NSA, I get those two confused. Um, uh, they're the ones who are responsible for the space spying, right? <laughs> and they actually have the biggest budget because they have a black space program. And they called up this NASA guy and were like, uh, do you want a couple of satellites? And uh, they had a couple going spare, it turned out. Um, and so this guy goes up to a clean room kind of in upstate New York, and inside this huge warehouse, he finds two um, better than Hubble quality space telescopes just sitting there unused. Uh, they were basically spare capacity from, from the US spying program. Um, so these were two telescopes that were better in capacity than the best telescope ever launched into space by civilians, and they were designed for pointing down, because <laughs> right, that's, that's, that's what we thought it was good to use them for. Um, but they've gone to NASA now, and in fact, the first of them was launched, I think, I think it was launched earlier this year, as the W first, the wide field Infra Inferometry Space Telescope, I think. Um, uh, and they've pointed it up. And they've pointed it out into space uh, to look for evidence of dark matter and search for new exoplanets, which are new, uh, previously unknown planets uh, that could hold the conditions for life. And that has been an entirely decision about how we choose to use the technologies um, at our disposal. Um, I have a whole other bit about the politics of what this means, but I've been talking way too much, so I'm just going to tell one more story and then I'm going to stop. Um, uh, we have a choice over how we use the material of our technologies, but we also have a choice about how we think and the metaphors that we gain from this. Something very interesting has happened. As I said, like, there's this incredible moment um, that we're going through now that uh, AI is having this kind of cultural moment, and it's making us all think about intelligence, just at the moment that we start to become aware 
of all the multiple other forms of intelligence that exist around us. Um, and this isn't the first time something that, like that has happened. Um, that actually it seems to me that there is a connection between the things that we make and the thoughts that we are capable of thinking. Um, when the internet was um, first being developed, um, uh, it presented kind of mathematicians with a, a bunch of quite interesting questions because the networks that we built didn't work like networks that had been made previously. They were ad hoc networks, or what's known as scale-free networks, uh, which means that they basically just started plugging computers together um, with this new protocol that allowed information to be shared asynchronously between all of them. And they discovered weird things, that basically you could add as many nodes to this network as you wanted. You could also remove nodes from this network, and the network would still survive and just route information elsewhere. Um, that it didn't matter how you could have just a few connections or many, so the network could have like a different shape, depending on where some bits having more connections than others, it still all functioned. And this didn't obey any of the kind of existing mathematics we had for analyzing networks. So a new field of kind of mathematical topological analysis came about called, um, called network theory that kind of became a mathematical description of how this worked. Um, at the same time, um, whoop, that's the story I'm not going to tell you, I have to wait for it. Um, some of the, at the same time, we were just starting to become, our well, researchers were just starting to become aware of the ways in which trees communicate and connect underground. Um, uh, what we've discovered in recent decades is that um, Trees uh, connect through what are called mycelial networks, essentially fungal networks that connect their roots. They connect across species. Uh, they connect particularly strongly with their own descendants, but they connect onto broader networks than that. Uh, they share nutrients. They also share information. Uh, if one tree is being harmed by insects, it will signal through this network uh, to allow other trees to defend itself. Um, when some trees lose their leaves in winters, the um, the coniferous trees, which keeps their leaves, will give nutrients to the broadleaf trees across species, and the reverse will happen there. All of this is, is going on, and it's been going on forever, for longer than we've been on this planet, but we we're kind of incapable of seeing it uh, until we had an understanding of how networks functioned. And I don't mean that in the abstract. The people who developed the first theories of what is amusingly sometimes called the wood wide web, um, uh, were people working in some of the institutions that were first connected to the internet. Right? They, were, they were people who were given the metaphors of the network that were provided by the development of technology. Those metaphors, that way of seeing the world as something network, didn't exist before. And not only that, but the, the mathematics of network theory allowed them to analyze the actual material transfers that were going on between the trees. They used the math that was developed for computer networks to, um, to make visible and make comprehensible the natural networks, which is not to say the two things are equivalent. Like the tree network is not like the internet. We could have a whole other discussion about why computational metaphors for things are wrong. But it, it's similar enough that, it's, that we can use one idea to think about the other. And that, that seems to me to be a fascinating process, that there is this, um, we seem to have the need to create kind of toy versions of the world in order to create a model of it in our own minds that then allows us to see the world around us. That, whether that's a quirk of uniquely human intelligence or something bigger, who, who really knows? Um, but it's kind of, to finish, <laughs> it's kind of my hope, or it's kind of my idea, <laughs> a, a hopeful one, um, that maybe that's kind of what's happening with AI. Um, that, that considered differently, considered not as a kind of acquisitive, corporate, aggressive AI that's here to beat us at chess and then take us jobs and then eventually kind of convert us into some kind of fuel. Um, AI is actually here to force us to recognize that there are other forms of intelligence in play. If AI is not human intelligence, then more than one kind of intelligence exists. And if more than one kind of intelligence, then potentially infinite. And it seems to be incredibly significant that just at the moment that we're starting to recognize these multiple forms of intelligence in our own creation, we're becoming aware that much vaster worlds are potentially far more interesting and certainly longer lived and more um, urgent of our attention intelligences that have surrounded us all along. Because a new Copernican moment looms in our future, a moment when, once again, the, the centrality 
of kind of human existence is knocked off its course so through, through our own actions, both through the development of high technologies, um, through the rapid expansion of capitalism, and through the destruction that it's doing to the planet. And we require this kind of urgent rethinking that also is going to require an urgent form of solidarity uh, with all the other beings that we share this planet with and an accounting of how intelligent they are and how ununique but necessary part of that larger world we are. Thank you very much. Uh,